many Christian churches have so-called boards of elders. And I say so-called because the word elder is really just a New Testament synonym for the word pastor. In the New Testament, an elder is not a board of laymen who come together to try to oversee the pastor. So these churches that have these so-called elders are not modeling anything in the New Testament. Frankly, what they're modeling is American business practice who has a board of directors to try to control the CEO to make sure he doesn't run roughshod over the corporation. And you guys have heard me say it a million times, this is not a business or a corporation. This is a family. It is the family of God, and until Christ returns, or until God sends me elsewhere, he's put me here to represent him to this family. Now someone, somewhere in the history of Trinity, was smarter than the average bear, because about 40 or 50 years ago, whoever it was got rid of that so-called board of elders. So we here don't happen to be hindered by that particular albatross that so many Missouri Synod congregations are hindered by. But I tell you all of that to tell you this. I have had to work with that board of so-called elders at every other congregation I've served, and I have noticed that they spend an inordinate amount of time focused on what they call delinquent members. So at one congregation that I worked with, a board of 12 men sat around a table, each assigned to his little segment of the congregation. And every month, they went all the way around the table, and each one reported on all the people on his list. And they spent a couple hours, at least, at every meeting, every month doing this, explaining why their people who weren't there weren't there. And if you were a delinquent member and you didn't show up with a proper excuse after a few months, then you received the official form letter that removed you from membership. Now, the Lord knows that I enjoy nothing more than stirring up a pot of self-righteous people. <laughs> and so I couldn't wait to ask them exactly how does one become delinquent from a volunteer organization? Well, they just guffawed and grumbled at me and went on with their thinly veiled gossip session. But my question is legitimate. What do we call people who rarely show up? People who give practically nothing financially or materially to the support of this place. I know for one thing they're not delinquent because we don't have membership dues here. We don't have particular requirements that you have to follow in order to be a member of this family. But then what do we do with them? Well, Jesus told a parable about them in our gospel for today. A man had a fig tree planted in a vineyard, and he came seeking fruit, and he didn't find any. And so he said to the vine dresser, look, <coughs> for three years I've been coming out here to get fruit off this fig tree, and I find none, so cut it down. It doesn't need to be using up space in my vineyard. And the vine dresser says, look, let me dig around it. Let me put on some fertilizer. And then next year, if it produces fruit, well and good. And if not, then you can cut it down. People who are rarely here worshiping are like that struggling fig tree. We don't know why they're not in worship. And it's sinful for us to judge their motives, motives that we cannot possibly know. I mean, maybe, just maybe, it's something about us. Maybe it has nothing to do with us at all. Maybe they've just become distracted with all the cares of this life or with all of the joys of this life. Maybe they are absolutely furious with God over something that is between them and God and has nothing to do with us. 
But whatever the reason, they have become disconnected from us. And if someone becomes disconnected from us, then they need some special attention, some special care, some nurturing. And this special care and this nurturing does not come in the way of a form letter saying you don't have a proper excuse so you've been removed from membership. Nor, by the way, does it come in a comment up at the jewel when you see them in the aisle. A comment, something like, well, look who's here, we thought you were dead. <laughs> see, special care for that disconnected person maybe looks like a, a card that says we're thinking of you and wondering how you're doing. Wondering if you need anything. Maybe it shows up as a, a phone call checking on that person to say we miss you and we want to know if we can help you with anything. Or maybe it comes as an invitation to have coffee or to come play darts or to sing in the choir or to learn how to knit. Folks, we live in an isolating world. And anything we can do to draw people here, to make them feel loved, is a good thing. It's a godly thing. See, further isolating them by making them feel badly for being disconnected seems a little counterproductive to me. I don't like being disconnected from people I love. I'm going to assume that most people don't like being disconnected from people they love. So if I can do something to facilitate your reconnection, you might just accept my offer. Jesus died on the cross for all people, not just for those of us who happen to show up here to worship him. He intended for all people to be part of his family. Every person in the family who is not regularly in worship is a person who is not getting word and he's not getting sacrament. And his faith is going hungry. He is a, a branch that's cut off from the vine. And our challenge is to reconnect him so that his faith can be fed, so that his faith can be strengthened, and so that he can thrive. I mean, would it concern you if one of your family members stopped eating? If he went a month or two without eating anything? I'm pretty sure that everyone here would call an ambulance. Or at least get your family member to the doctor. We have the same concern over a family member who is spiritually starving. So, if we look around us and we notice that someone's missing, we don't need to assemble a committee to discuss it. We don't need to have a little gossip session about why that person might be missing. Go see them. Give them a call. See if he's okay. Maybe he's just worshiping in another congregation now. That's great. Problem solved. Let me know so that I can get all the records straight. But maybe there's another problem that is causing him to be disconnected from the family, from God's word, and from the sacrament. And when it's another problem, see, that's when we get to be Jesus to that person. That's when we get to do for them what Jesus did for us. Because at some point, every single one of us were lost and disconnected people. Lost and condemned creatures is the way the confessions say it. You were a child of Satan. And Jesus Christ reached through that water of holy baptism. And with his word, he connected you to the family. He claimed you. And now it is our privilege to do that exact thing, same thing for others who are disconnected. We get to be like Jesus. See, Jesus is not someone who walks around being holier than everyone else. 
Jesus is not someone who walks around judging everyone who's not doing everything just the way he thinks they should. Being Jesus is doing something about that person who's separated from the family. Being Jesus is digging around that person and fertilizing it with word and sacrament and love and kindness and concern. Being Jesus means getting your hands dirty so that tree might produce fruit. It's showing love and concern for people, but especially for people who are weak and who are sick and who are lost. And that is really some of the most beautiful work we ever get to do.